So let me start by, uh, continue by introducing the other folks. And we'll start with uh, Brendan Flannelly King. And uh, here's what we're going to do. I'm sorry. We're gonna, everybody's going to take two minutes to introduce themselves on the panel, including some lenders who are here at the front. And then we're going to jump in with their stories. And then we'll have about 30 minutes at the end for questions and answers. But we'll start with introductions, a couple of minutes from each person. Brendan. Uh, my name is Brendan Flannelly King. Um, I'm the finance and facility manager of Real Pickles Cooperative, which is at Greenfield, Massachusetts, about half an hour south of here. Um, we make pickles, as the name suggests. Um, it's 100% uh, organic, um, and uh, we purchase all of our vegetables uh, from within the Northeast, mostly from um, the Pioneer Valley, Western Massachusetts, southern Vermont. Um, and we sell within that region as well. Um, essentially uh, preserving the seasonal harvest um, for sale throughout the year. Um, and uh, we're a mission-driven business. That's the primary piece of our mission. Um, we're promoting human and ecological health um, and a strong regional food system. Um, the business started in 2001. Uh, Daniel Rosenberg was the founder. He's still a worker owner at the business. Um, and last year, just in terms of size of the business, we purchased 333,000 pounds of vegetables wow. um, and about uh, 1.4 million in, in sales. Um, and uh, we have about 20 staff people, um, 10 of whom, almost 12, who are owners, um, who get to make sort of high level decisions about the business, one of which is approving loans, which makes full back value. And uh, the lender for uh, Real Pickles Cooperative is Co uh, Cooperative Fund of New England, and Maggie Cohn is here on their behalf. Please introduce yourself and your organization. Can I stand up? I wish you would. Thank you. Um, oh, more people have come. That's good. Um, my name is Maggie Cohn. I am a loan officer with the Cooperative Fund of New England, which lends across New England and into New York State. Uh, we lend only to cooperatives, worker co-ops, farming co-ops, fishing co-ops, housing co-ops, food co-ops. If it's a democratically controlled entity owned by its users or workers or whatever, we would consider making a loan to you. Um, we do subordinate debt, but we also like to do senior debt. Um, and at, we are com a community development finance institution, so we look traditionally as a lender. We look at collateral. We look at your financial projections and past financials and look for a good loan package to make a loan. Um, we are connected to a number of technical assistance providers, so we like to hook people up with the necessary assistance so that they are really ready to take out a loan and have a viable plan to move forward by the time their loan application gets to my loan committee. Because our goal, as we say, is to have a business succeed, not to, you know, sell off your house. <laughs> That's all. Thank you. Kate is up next. Hi, everyone. I'm Kate Welly McCabe. I own and operate the Vermont Evaporator Company. Um, are there any sugar makers in the audience? Anybody who's ever made maple syrup? Anybody who's currently making maple syrup in their backyard, no sugar shack, sort of putting on the grill? All right. I've got at least one customer in the audience. <laughs> My husband and I moved to a new house with a nice sugar stand in 2013, and by 2015 we had tried out all the sort of food on your grill, light a fire, put a pot over it kind of methods that people use typically when they're starting their maple sugaring hobby. My husband's an engineer and a serial hobbyist, and so instead of um, being satisfied with the vacuum in the market, there is nothing available for a backyard sugar maker that is efficient um, or affordable. Uh, he invented something, and so our flagship um, product is called the Sapling. It's a 55-gallon barrel that's been retrofitted with legs, a door, uh, a smokestack, and a real baffled stainless um, pan with a pour-off valve. So it's available during the season for $8.95. It's cheaper on the off-season, like right now. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's portable. It's multifunctional. It turns into a grill or a smoker in the off season, and I can ship it anywhere. And in fact, have as far west as Minnesota, down to Kentucky, all over New England, and we just started the distributorship in Canada. There are 8.6 million people in Quebec, and they're even more into it than we are. Who knew? 
Um, so we, over the course of 2015 to now, moved from the garage to an actual facility. Um, we've created a couple of jobs. Um, we have, um, like I said, sold all over the country and are still having fun. So there are pamphlets for anyone who's interested here. Oh, I, and I'm here with Lisa Shibley, who a lot of you probably already know, but um, Please. 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 So I'm Louisa Shilley with Milk Money, and we basically are an equity crowdfunding platform that allows Vermonters to invest in Vermont businesses. Um, it's, we're using um, a regulation called the Vermont Small Business Offering Exemption, and basically means that any Vermonter, you don't have to be a credit or wealthy, but any Vermonter can basically invest in <coughs> companies like Kate's. Um, it's pretty much in a nutshell, we'll go into probably more detail later. Excellent. And Greg is next. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Greg George Aklas. I'm the owner and a co-founder of um, Farmers to You, which is located in Berlin, Barry, Vermont. And um, what we are, technically speaking, is a farm-to-table grocer online. Um, and uh, we service primarily the Boston market. And at the moment, we have 80 partner farmers in the mostly Vermont area, and we're feeding about 850 families each week, all year long. So um, I thought I was starting a business. Um, my co-founder is sitting next to me, even though he's here doing something else That's right now. That's totally a coincidence. I didn't know it when he I started that. <laughs> and, um, uh, when we first started it, it felt like a business, but it, it's quickly turned into um, a community and a movement. Um, what we're really all about is creating an alternative food system that's here to support farmers who want to farm at a smaller scale and do really high quality farming, mostly organic, and also supporting families who want an alternative food system where they have complete transparency about where their food's coming from. So each week of the year, our families go online um, to their account, and each week they order whatever they want from these 80 farmers and put their availability that we are carrying up on the website. They complete their order by Sunday at midnight. By Monday, the farmers have their orders. By Tuesday, we're packing your order, and by Wednesday and Thursday, we're delivering it and handing it to you in Boston, and we do have four sites in Vermont also at this time. So it's very efficient, it's very simple, it's a batch system. Um, the cash flow is lovely. Um, it's the first and only business I've ever been in that has a consistent level cash flow 12 months a year, which is always remarkable. Um, it's a pipe dream for bankers, they say. Um, so um, we've been doing it for eight years and we're really creating something totally new. So we're learning, we're learning all the time. And uh, we're really looking forward to getting ourselves uh, fully sustainable. We just finally broke a profit, operating profit, which was great news. And this year, we're hoping to really show a strong financial return at the end of the year and a good, solid growth. Thank you. And Greg is here with uh, his lender, Janice St. Arm, the Flexible Capital Fund. Great to see everybody. Uh, I'm Janice Sinan with the Flexible Capital Fund, and we are a small mission-based investment fund that provides growth capital to companies in Vermont's food system, forestry, and clean energy sector. So it's pretty broad. Um, our predominant instrument of choice is royalty or revenue share financing, and it functions closer to equity than debt without diluting ownership and without um, having to um, participate in decision making um, with the business. So we, um, royalty financing very briefly is uh, essentially we get repaid based on a percentage of revenue over time up to a multiple on our money. And once that multiple is complete, the, bit, the loan is, is uh, over and done with. And the idea is essentially that your payments as you're growing in your earlier stages are going to be lower and not fixed like a set principal and interest payment might be in a term loan. And it grows as you, as the business grows, so there's more flexibility in the cash flow in the early stages that you would have had, would not have had if you were paying a set principal and interest payment can be put back into the business. So that's kind of the premise around royalty financing. We're the only licensed lender in the state of Vermont using that instrument of uh, primarily. Um, we are also what's called a community development financial institution, the CDFI, that provides us with access to other types of capital. Um, uh, some of which we can use as grant funds to support 
support our borrowers, so we provide CEO advisory services if they are needed, um, and we do that through our grant funding with the Senior Five Fund. Um, so we're not just about capital, we're also about supporting our businesses and long-term partners. Um, and I guess I'll leave it at that. Great. Tom. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Tom Sperber. I joined High Mowing Seeds five years ago um, as the CEO. Tom Stearns is still the owner, and we work together closely. Uh, the company uh, has taken me all of five years to really understand. There are two main pieces that uh, you need to understand about the business. We grow, and we are the only 100% uh, organic seed company of any size in the United States. And when I say any size, the next largest one to us is 20% of our size. We do sales over $5 million. Um, and uh, most are in the $100,000 range, spattered over different areas. Um, the challenge that orga being organic only in the seed industry is that organic, certified organic growers do not need to purchase organic seed. So breeders and producers who invest in seed development, which would cost on average a quarter of a million dollars to develop a, a variety of the seed in any vegetable crop type, um, uh, tend to sell and want the market to be as large as possible, so they sell conventionally and grow conventionally. Um, so we have to work very hard to expand varieties of organic seed and find producers in the seed producing regions in order to grow those seeds. The second piece that is um, uh, challenging, exciting, and um, uh, creates financial challenges is uh, that we are seasonal, extremely seasonal. We have 70% of our sales between uh, January 1st and April 30th. Mm -hmm. uh, and usually, to get a good supply of seed, it's a living thing. So, as an example, carrots and onions you can count on for one year. Um, corn you might be able to count on for five if you store it well. Um, so you have this living product that you need to turn and you need to purchase it with a two-year lead time. Because you have growers who have to grow this living thing and in all sorts of conditions and you need insurance crops so that you can deliver it to people who are counting on your seed. And you add to that that the growing season for a seed is at least 30 days longer than for the vegetable because you want the, the seeds to ripen on the vine and the fruit. So it's a, a, it's a rich business. It's very important, I think, what we're doing to continue to push and add varieties that are both um, uh, commercial grower grade, but also um, same traditions and heirloom varieties as well. But it is, uh, it's mission driven and it needs to be profit driven. And we do have, we, we are quite focused on profitability as well. And Tom's lender is Vermont Community Loan Fund. That's the organization I work for. Vermont Community Loan Fund is also a community development financial institution, a CDFI. We're a 30 year old nonprofit organization in the business of making loans for <coughs> certain small businesses. That either can't get bank financing or can't get all the financing they need from a traditional source. They also make loans to affordable housing developers. That's a different program. I have nothing to do with that. I have nothing to do with this. Um, but those are our two main lines of business. In addition, uh, as uh, I think Maggie and Janice both referenced, um, uh, in addition to making loans to businesses, we provide ongoing business advisory services to our borrowers in an effort to help our borrowers uh, learn more about the sort of capital B part of business uh, and help them grow and thrive. Um, we get our money from individual and institutional investors, individuals like all of you, uh, who uh, invest as little as $1,000 or less under a certain program uh, in the Vermont Community Loan Fund. And then we aggregate all that money from socially minded investors uh, and take the risk of making loans uh, to, to businesses, uh, essentially on behalf of people. So that's what we do. So for very different kinds of entrepreneurs, um, obviously all food related, but one of the business of making food related equipment, 
Uh, one focused almost exclusively on pickles, almost exclusively. Um, one focused on everything a farm can produce and one growing seeds. When I first met Tom Ferber and, and Tom Stearns, I was appalled to hear that if you want to sell seeds, you got to throw out the rest of the crop. Go <laughs> figure. Um, so now, now that you've, we've all been introduced, um, uh, I'm going to turn it back to each of these entrepreneurs for about 10 minutes each. And they're going to tell you uh, about their stories of how they acquired the debt that they uh, are here to tell you about, why that particular kind of debt was, was needed at the time they got it. And um, we'll hear each of their stories. And then, as I said, afterwards, we'll have a chance for Q&A. So we'll start with Brendan and the subordinated debt uh, that uh, his organization obtained from Dr. Uh, Fundu. So um, I'm primarily going to talk about the uh, subordinated debt with CFA, um, but just to give a little background, there's been a lot of other kinds of debt and a lot of other financing that's happened um, since 2001, um, just to get us up to the point where we started our relationship with um, CFA. Um, and uh, like Tom was talking about, we have a very seasonal business, not with sales like they do, but with um, with our ingredients. Um, so we have to purchase um, everything from August to about uh, December um, that we then sell over the course of the year. Um, and so there's a tremendous amount of operating capital that's needed to uh, make those purchases. Um, and so uh, financing has always been an important part of the, um, our business. Is that better? Yeah. Um, and it, it started with the um, CDFI, uh, the Franklin Community uh, Development Corporation, uh, was the first person that extended a loan to the business um, you know, when it was unbankable. Um, and then uh, our local bank eventually came on board when we had a track record. Um, and uh, there's a, a little bit of a complication with the um, worker cooperative. Uh, we do the the building that we operate out of is owned um, by one of the worker owners who is the founder of the business, um, and so there is a lot of financing, including a tremendous amount of subordinated debt um, from the CDs, from our local CDC, from an organization called Equity Trust, um, which does a lot of land purchasing for farmers, um, and from friends and family loans um, that help the building purchase happen. And then in 2013, uh, when we formed a worker cooperative, we bought the business um, from the founders. Um, and that was, uh, that was the first point where we uh, started our relationship with CF&E um, to, at that point, largely just to increase our operating capital. Um, we got a loan from them um, in, uh, from a sort of higher risk uh, entity that doesn't exist anymore called the Cooperative Capital Fund of New England. Um, and that was very helpful for um, the growth that we were going through at that time. Um, and the actual purchase of the business was uh, financed primarily through equity from a preferred stock offering, um, which is very interesting and maybe not as relevant here, but I'm happy to talk about that um, elsewhere if you're interested. Um, so, um, and that, uh, so because the business is, is renting from our landlord, we had, as we're growing, um, any changes we make to our facility, our leasehold improvements, and that's something that um, traditional banks are a little wary of financing because it's not, you know, you put a lot of money into a building that you don't own. Um, and uh, so that's um, where we got our biggest loan from CFE in 2016. Um, we uh, added about 30% of our warehouse space. We have to, our barrels of um, ferments need to sit for quite a long time, so we need a lot of space um, uh, to have our, to see our process through. Um, and we were we were running out of it. We were you know putting barrels in every every spot we could find. Um, and uh, and we approached our bank. Um, 
as a first step. Uh, we have a revolving line of credit with our, our local bank, uh, Greenfield Savings Bank, has been wonderful, but they are conventional and a little wary. Um, and they were sort of willing to entertain the idea. Um, and then we had this existing relationship with cf &E, and we thought, oh, we should just ask them. Um, and they were not just willing, but eager and excited, um, which is uh, a lot, a lot, it's a much better relationship um, with someone who's going to give you money. Um, and uh, extremely helpful. Um, as, uh, as Maggie was saying, um, we have uh, we had someone who was helping us through the process, get up, getting all our um, financials together, getting all our um, you know preparing us to make the application for the loan, um, which was uh, super helpful and really quite easy. Um, and um, the whole process was smooth. Um, um, and just to give you a picture of, of the business at that point, um, we had um, so we had a primary lender, our local bank, $150,000 line of credit. Um, we had this uh, preferred share equity, uh, $500,000. Um, we had this sort of uh, smaller $70,000 loan from the Cooperative Fund in New England. And we had, because we're a worker cooperative, we have uh, member capital equity that we all put in uh, when we uh, take on ownership of the business, as well as our uh, portion of retained earnings. Um, and that was about uh, $40,000. Um, and so we had a, essentially a $200,000 $200, project to fund. Um, and uh, like I said, the bank was, was a little wary. Um, and uh, everything went very smoothly with CF&E. Um, Can you talk a little bit about why you think the bank was wary at that point? Um, they have, so a little, a little complication is they, they also hold the mortgage on the building, um, and so they didn't, I think they were wary of overextending their um, exposure in our business. Um, we also have had at that point a pretty good track record, and so that's why they were willing, um, and it just seemed like a much better fit um, to bring on CF&E. Um, and I should also say that uh, participation, the um, it's not just CF&E um, that we loan from. There was participation from the Pioneer uh, PV Grows Loan Fund, um, and that's a, a much smaller loan fund in, I think, just in Western Massachusetts. I don't think they do Southern Vermont. Um, uh, it is an excellent mission fit for us, um, and we were able to increase the amount of the loan slightly. Um, and then, you know, one thing that happens when you have subordinated debt um, is you have to make sure all all the parties get along, um, and and they all agree to the um, the terms that are on the table. Um, and it was, you know, so we had three. You know, the, our primary lender had to okay the debt, um, and both of, since the subordinated debt was actually more than the primary loan, both of the subordinated uh, lenders had to make sure, you know, they wanted to make sure that our primary debt didn't go up too high, um, getting above uh, getting above a certain threshold, so we have a, a cap on our primary debt um, as part of the loan. So really interesting to me in that the business's primary asset actually doesn't belong to the business. It belongs to one of the worker members. So their big asset, their building, wasn't available to fund as collateral. They already had a senior lender, a bank, who had loaned money, but they needed more money and needed a lender who was willing to come in below or behind the bank as a subordinated lender. And that's where the came out. Really and so we, you know, just talking about collateral, we don't, you know, we have pickles as collateral. We have, we have pretty, um, and, and we can sell our pickles, and we sell our pickles pretty well, but a bank doesn't, you know, they don't count that as much. They don't expect they're going to sell our pickles for what we can sell our pickles for. Um, and so that lack of collateral was another, definitely another reason why the bank was hesitant. Um, and I think that um, talking about CF&E or some of these other um, community investment funds like the mission fit is a huge piece of uh, what the bank or what the lender is investing in um, and it makes a big difference um, you know in what they're willing to to invest in and the risks they're willing to take um, and so if you have a, a strong mission there's probably a lender out there who's like a good fit for you 
um, and who will be excited to learn about it. Excellent. Well, in contrast, Kate, <laughs> uh, you don't grow pickles or brine them. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, they're not brine them. Some of them are, yeah, okay. <clears throat> but not in vinegar. <laughs> uh, you have a husband who tinkered and came up with a marketable product, and then what happened? <laughs> So I'm realizing that I left some things out. I'm not sure that I told you we're only three years in. Um, and I didn't give you any numbers. We're selling in the low hundreds of thousands per year now. So we're so year one was a beta test at garage, year two was an actual um, factory year, year three is what we've just what I'm just now recovering from. Um, <laughs> Uh, so, and the other thing is our business is also very seasonal. We probably do about 90% of our business from July 1st, or excuse me, from um, January 1st through the end of April. So when May comes, the switch flips and I get to the cover. <laughs> so um, what happened was we thought we would do a beta season in the garage. Um, we and our families put in about $2,000. We made a dozen units. Um, that our idea was, well, if this doesn't go so well, we'll just break even and we'll have a free sugaring machine. You know, We'll have our own product and then everybody can just go about their business. Um, we actually sold the balance of the units in 10 days using Craigslist exclusively to postings. And we ended up with a $6,000 profit, which is the last time we've seen a profit. <laughs> um, it was lovely. <laughs> so, um, we, we, but it was an illustration of um, you know, the fact that we had actually stumbled on something that we were not the only ones that were desirous of. So we moved from there to getting an advisor. And are there people in the audience who are like thinking about starting a business, just having started a business? Like I'm a real newbie. So um, I would recommend um, the SBDC, which is, you're nodding your head. Uh, we have a great advisor through them who helped us uh, apply for and obtain our first loan from Community Capital of Vermont, a loan fund. Um, that was a $50,000 loan, and that went into purchasing what is now our primary piece of collateral, which is $50,000 worth of machinery. We, we run our own powder coating operation. So we, not, we manufacture the metal thing. We cut and bend and reinforce metal, and then we paint the metal. Um, at the same time, I met Louisa and um, started uh, putting together a milk money campaign. And the milk money campaign was successful. We raised about $30,000, a little over $30,000 from 45 different Vermonters in increments of 250 was our lowest and $5,000 was, $5, was our highest investment. That instrument is a convertible debt instrument, which in very lay terms uh, is we get the money for free for five years, and then either party can say, nope, Kate's going to pay you back at 5% interest over the course of the following five years, or I want my money back at 5% interest over the course of the next five years. Or if both parties are in agreement, um, that debt can be converted to equity in the company. The only thing that could change that equation is if something really big happens um, between now and what is now three years from now when we start, um, when that debt becomes due. So that was our first year. Um, and then in our second year, I actually became what, what I've heard people term banked. So I went to a, a real bank and they gave me real money in the form of a line of credit. So um, I got a better, the bank actually took over my community capital um, loan. I got a better um, rate of interest and then also extended uh, a line of credit of $50,000. So um, that line of credit is, um, you know, I get to spend it and then I have to pay it back and then I have to wait 30 days before using it again. And the purpose of that line of credit is um, to help with the seasonality of our business. We get the money, we spend the money on stuff, we make the stuff into other stuff, we sell the stuff. Um, and then uh, because I didn't get quite as much as I wanted um, from the bank, I don't have that much collateral yet, um, I also have a small loan from CVEDC, Central Vermont Economic Development Corporation, which is another loan fund. So I'm sort of half banked at the moment. 
um, and uh, we have just started sort of putting out feelers and being contacted and making appointments to have beers with um, people in the venture capital um, community and so that could be you know in a couple of years if I'm ever invited back to this panel that that would be something I would talk about too of course not debt that would be equity but um, that's the lifeline. That's the Beer is a key part of the <laughs> Kate, why did you need milk money? Uh, one thing I heard you say was convertible debt, and it sounds like they helped you figure out the convertible debt. Was there any other reason you needed milk money instead of just going out on your own and raise the money? Yeah, so convertible debt, we determined um, after doing some self-education and, and having a little bit of guidance from you guys was um, the most appropriate instrument. There's other instruments that you can go for under milk money. Um, but we had friends and family who were really enthusiastic about investing in our company, but we wanted to be careful about managing those relationships and we wanted to have an intermediary. We did think about, um, you know, doing Kickstarter or one of those other kinds of um, internet raises for that purpose. But um, just really liked the milk money idea and wanted to give it a shot. And we were, you know, I don't know, the third business that you did business with and um, the first to close or the first to, to draw money or something. So we were just excited. It's a great idea. And uh, we had a good experience. So, so you have lenders who are friends and family. So yes. So had to go through milk money to get there? Correct. And every once in a while when I'm at a social event and somebody asks me how the business is going, I have to say, okay, it's going great. <laughs> no. <laughs> it is an interesting, it's interesting to, to know the people that Yeah, that was my question, here. is even though you have an intermediary in the form of milk money to handle the financial transactions, you still have direct contact with those people when it comes to the business. Oh, sure, yeah. Um, so I do quarterly updates for all of my milk money investors as well as, um, you know, anybody else who's got a, um, a financial stake, my family, the banks, and that sort of thing. But the, I mean, a lot of these people I see, um, you know, in my daily life, so. So subordinated debt mixed in with a bunch of other kinds of debt at Real Pickles, convertible debt that may turn into equity in a few years, uh, mixed in with some other debt as well. Anything else to say before we turn it over to Greg? I don't think so. Well, Greg, tell us your story of uh, how you financed your business. I'll pass yeah, the light. Yeah. 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 You don't have to leave your parties. Okay. So let's see. Started the business uh, basically with some savings that I had from a sale of a previous business and um, fully expected to become highly profitable within two and a half years. Um, well, that plan didn't quite turn out. And, um, and at that point, I sat down and really started asking questions. I knew about the Flex Capital Fund. We had been talking to Janice on and off anyway, and I was familiar with it through my work with the farm to plate research that was done earlier on, and that's kind of where Flex Capital came out of, that's kind of where Farmers to You came out of also, conceptually. And so, um, started talking to Janice, and they started talking to me about this royalty financing, which seemed like a good fit for us. The money is early stage money, and like all early stage money, it's expensive. Um, but the flexibility in terms of linking the payments to your revenues was enticing and they also uh, were able to start us off at a lower rate and then bump the rate after we got over a certain threshold, over a million dollars in revenue. And so, um, uh, and so that worked and we ended up with two quick rounds. We ended up with $350,000 of royalty financing and we're coming into our fourth year. Um, it's been a little, the growth has been slower than anticipated, but um, the relationship has been good. Um, and again, some technical assistance we have received. Um, we get coaching, we get phone calls, we share financials on a monthly basis and usually have a conversation in depth once a quarter, which is great because I don't know who said it before, but you know, being an entrepreneur is, I think Raymond said it, you know, you have the echo chamber in your head um, and you start losing the arguments with yourself after a while, it gets a little creepy. So it's nice having folks that you can bounce stuff off of or get ideas from, or who ask you the really tough questions that you're avoiding like the plague. 
Um, from there, I'll just mention that after that, uh, we needed more financing, so we ended up doing a um, convertible debt device and uh, a number of people who um, are in the community up here as well as in Boston invested and we raised another round and presently we've also been playing with um, an equity round amongst our families in Boston because ideally we would love them to have a real stake in the game. And so that's another opportunity for us moving forward. Our ultimate goal with uh, Farmers to You is to perfect the model and then replicate it. Basically work with other communities across the country to implement a similar model so that they can recreate regional and local food systems um, in their communities. Um, that's the only solution that I see that's really viable for kind of the skewed industrial scale food system that we have right now that has zero transparency. So Flex Capital helped us get over that initial um, hump where we needed a chunk of cash. I needed to work with people who it was not, you know, it didn't take us a lot of work to work with Flex Capital. That's another key benefit. And because as a loan entrepreneur, I mean, at that point I was driving the trucks. We were, you know, there was a couple of us loading the trucks, going to Boston every week, going to pick up all the food at the farms. You know, you're a, you're a one man band basically. And, um, um, so it's hard to like really dig in and take the time to do a full-on raise with other investors where you're going to need to spend a lot of time to talk with them and all that. So we weren't really bankable also. I'll also mention that. This model doesn't really have a lot of assets. It's very much um, we are in kind of a brokerage position. We buy all the, the food after the families order it, and then we send it to Boston, and the families pay us by credit card as soon as we pack their order and, and hit the button. So it's a good model, but the model really doesn't require much of any assets. Um, we lease a warehouse, and we lease a couple of uh, large refrigerated trucks, and we have a bunch of other bags, tools, totes, equipment, refrigeration, things like that, but not any big land assets. I think one of the things that's common among all the lenders that are here is that we don't primarily rely on collateral when we make a loan. We all want collateral, um, but I think it's probably fair to say that uh, Flexible Capital Fund is the most flexible when it comes to collateral uh, and tends to be in subordinate positions. Uh, with their royalty financing. Another thing that I heard you say, Greg, and actually I think uh, Brendan and Kate said it as well, but not as uh, bluntly, and that is that Greg started with his own money. You know, the first place you go for money when you start a business or you have an early stage business is usually to yourself. In Kate's case, friends and family, but she didn't want to make those apps direct. Um, but they all started, you know, the founder of Real Fit was also started with his own money. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so there's a real mix of financing types in here. Um, but in the case of um, farmers to you, the royalty financing was very important to know this because they weren't bankable and they needed lower payments initially so they could uh, ramp up their growth so they have a run. Raymond, also, at the stage of growth we were at, we had something of a track record, but this is a brand new model. So I had explained this to some bankers and some other people and got kind of the blank stare and a lot of head scratching. The other beauty of Flex Capital is they were part of the um, Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund, which had done a lot of the work on the farm to plate study, and they understood the dynamics of the food system. And so it didn't take a ton of convincing to have them understand that this was a critical piece of what we were trying to rebuild. Well, finally then, uh, Tom Ferber of High Mowing Organic Team. Uh, Tom was not there at the beginning of High Mowing, but I came in at a critical moment. But tell us about your capital journey. Uh, well, we've done a bunch of uh, four different types of uh, capital acquisition methods since I've arrived. We've done um, unsecured uh, subordinate debt through individuals and some institutions. We've done, and that was to help purchase a farm. Um, we've done um, a, uh, we just finished a, a preferred stock 
round, um, and uh, uh, where we uh, uh, traded some equity for a preferred, a preferred vehicle. We, um, we have done traditional, excuse me, expanded our traditional bank lending um, with peoples who we've been with since they were Chittenden, um, and they've been very, very helpful with us. And then um, finally, we've expanded with uh, BCLF. Um, the uh, the exciting thing, or that the uh, the exciting thing about working at High Mowing is we really want to change the world, and um, it's uh, relatively easy with our track record and our sales to attract people and investors who are interested in changing the world as well. The um, the opportunity we have and the challenge we have is the other one I talked about, which is the seasonality of our business and the perishability of our inventory. So we got an opportunity with Whole Foods, who got really into understanding organic seed, and they wanted a, a, a sh us to do a sprouting seed program. And we told them that we wanted to do it in one of their regions. And the grocery buyer came back and said that they wanted it national. And we had six weeks to um, produce a f uh, food grade sprout tested for salmonella and all sorts of other things. Um, and thank goodness that the Center for Ag Economy was up in Hardwick and just down the road. And we had only forecast that we would pack um, 15,000 packets in our first year. And we did um, somewhere like 150 in our first run. And um, we needed some support, so we got some support from Peoples, and we got some support from um, VCLF in order to purchase all the inventory that we needed in order to move that sprouting seed. Um, the next year, we had an extraordinary opportunity to purchase a farm that had great soil level, um, in the town of Hyde Park, which is right adjacent to our property, and uh, where we, our property, I say, but we lease a warehouse operation in Woolcott. And in order to do that, we needed to issue some um, unsecured debt with investors who liked the mission of us adding a farm. The challenge with adding a farm is you're adding a significant amount of uh, capital and infrastructure where you're not going to make that asset as productive as the acreage that you have. And you're certainly paying more than you would for leased land. So our debt coverage, um, our debt ratios spiked fairly aggressively. And uh, we needed, um, uh, our banker did not want to expand our line of credit as we were growing. That was. Uh, in that year, um, with the uh, uh, the sprouts, we grew at 20 percent, um, and uh, um, but we we could not expand because of the debt we took on to purchase the farm. We did not want to use equity at the time. Um, we could not uh, expand our line of credit with people. So they were very supportive of our mission and what we were doing, and they were committed to the levels that they had given us and increased for us at the time that we expanded into Sprouts. And that's where um, BCLF stepped up for us. And I want to pause here to say to all the entrepreneurs that um, Financing is all about relationships. You're gonna have uh, things that don't work. Um, the sprouting thing was an ex extreme pressure on the organization. And within 18 months, our sales at Whole Foods for um, uh, sprouts were de minimis. And the rest of our business, however, were matching the sales that we were doing with Sprouts in that first year in our core business. So it helped us launch it and move it along, but it, uh, it was a, a different model too. Um, I, don't, I don't need to get into that. But um, the relationships that we'd built over the years and the time that Raymond took to really understand a complicated seed business and to go beyond the mission into looking at what we were trying to do, how complex it was, and that, and the belief that we could do it, um, really uh, 
um, at enabled us to continue to grow. The, the thing that I find challenging in my role is that, and I imagine most people here feel the same way, is that you don't have any time. <laughs> and that uh, you have to make the time for when hiccups come to talk to your lenders and investors and explain it to them before anybody else knows. And, uh, and what I've uh, enjoyed is uh, communicating with Raymond and BCLF about the hiccups because they, um, they are a sounding board. As, Je as Greg was speaking, you are in your own head oftentimes. And you can say, this is what I'm doing. This is what has happened, and this is what I'm doing. Do you have any questions, thoughts, anything that you'd like to change or add to that? And usually there's good stuff to add, but I don't want to make a call like that and say, this is what happened. What do you think? <laughs> it's, this is what happened, and this is what we want to do. Um, and it, it strengthens the relationships over time so that there's trust um, when the next hiccup happens, because they're going to happen. Um, so uh, the, the thing that I, I like is the, that the VCLF uh, is a revolving line of credit, much like Kate described. We need to rest it for 30 days. Um, right now it's, uh, am I okay divulging how much it is? Sure. Um, we, we have $600,000 on a line. Um, we, uh, um, we it's secured with uh, um, secondary tertiary mortgages on the property with uh, working capital and, but, uh, and a whole lot of trust. And I think this is a key about uh, the subordinated debt that High Mowing Seeds has, and that is they had a senior loan from a bank, and still do, but couldn't expand that to meet their current needs. We had a lending relationship with High Mowing Organic Seeds, and were able to come in and make a subordinate loan behind the bank for the same purpose the bank is doing, uh, and taking more risk at a lower amount than they borrowed from the bank, uh, but at greater risk because we're in the second position. So both Brendan and Tom have talked about subordinated loans, as the primary loans we're talking about here, loans that are behind the bank. Case talked about convertible debt, debt that may convert to equity someday. Uh, Greg talked about royalty financing, which is really essentially a different form of repayment. Um, but the other thing I heard from all of these that I learned today, and you know, I've talked to all of these people repeatedly over the last few months to get ready for this, but today what I realized is that there's no one solution to financing for any business. Each of these businesses has multiple sources of financing. And I'm reminded of, you know, the, the old investment pyramid where in, uh, investment advisors say when you invest your money, you should have, you know, a broad base of safe investments. And as you go up the pyramid, you know, less and less money invested in the higher risk investments. Well, borrowing money is sort of the same thing. You should borrow from more than one source if you can, so that you're not putting all your eggs in one basket. What if? Tom had called the bank and said, I need to expand my line of credit. And they said, no, we're not going to do that. And in fact, we're not going to lend you any money anymore. That would have really hurt. But the fact that Tom and I would argue all of these entrepreneurs have multiple borrowing relationships protects them should they have a, when the next need comes around. Well, thanks to all of you. And now we have a lot of time for questions and discussion. And please uh, speak up, raise your hand, stand up, throw a question out. Karen Croft, the infamous Karen Croft. What's missing out there? What did you, what, what were you unable to access when you wanted to access in terms of money? Or what are you having trouble accessing now? That's the next piece of it. Um, Yeah. <laughs> uh, you want me to buy some time? Yeah, well, no, it, it, one of the things that's really challenging is um, I don't think any of these businesses are real soundbite businesses. And uh, if you're trying to change something fundamental um, about the way people do things, it's, uh, 
uh, uh, it's it's a real it's a, it's a real labor of love, um, and uh, um, the, if you if we went to the venture end of the spectrum, the returns that are expected and the speed with which they're expected um, set, is unrealistic for the type of business that that we're in. Um, I don't want to speak for everybody, but it, it's. Um, uh, that, and there's enough pressure just, uh, you know, I was at the, last, the keynote about the town in Italy, and, um, and I go to a, an enormous, you know, the, the oldest trade association in the country, the American Seed Trade Association, and um, um, there's a little organic committee, and we're the smallest company by, I don't know, some factor of 100. Um, and, um, Yet after the last organic session, when they were talking about the EU standards and that um, breed, the only breeding techniques that would be allowed were uh, a OP, um, hybrid with, with manual human intervention, not with any sort of uh, intervention, that um, um, I had one of our largest suppliers come up to me afterwards and tell me that I was ruining the entire um, organic seed in industry worldwide because I was supporting this, um, it, and and you know you just I, it, the, the scale and the bumping into that type of thing. So investors that and lenders that can understand the the long haul um, and a, and and the the risks when you're trying to uh, trying to change things. Okay. Okay, uh, the middle class needs to be able to source money from the middle class. So this is part of why we thought um, milk money was such a great idea. Before milk money, if I wanted to raise money from friends and family, I would be prohibited by laws that were written in the 1930s after the Great Depression or during the Great Depression from raising that money person to person um, by securities laws, uh, unless that person on the other end was worth at least a million dollars. And that's not even including their primary residence. I know one millionaire, <laughs> it's my uncle, and I did a, a round, an equity round, before milk money just to get him in. Um, I know a lot of other people uh, nationally who would have loved to invest in my business. We played around with trying to think about whether we could do that. It's prohibited by law. So those laws need to be changed, not just in states, but on a federal level, uh, so that the middle class can source money from the people that they know, uh, and that's you know people in their own their own backyards. To play devil's advocate, isn't that the fact? Um, well, year one for me, it wasn't the bank. I couldn't get anything from the bank. Um, I don't know if the bank is the middle class or not. Um, and I would have been able to get money quicker, more money quicker, if I were allowed by law to take money from the people in my life. And doesn't the VSBO accomplish what? Absolutely. You yep. And um, it, it did. It worked wonderfully for people who are Vermonters, but you have to have a Vermont license. The VSBO, which you mentioned earlier, the Vermont Small Business Office. Exemption. The exemption. Not an exemption. The so it means that she basically only has to register with the state of Vermont, the Department of Financial Regulation, as opposed to register with the SEC. We just keep it in Vermont. And so it's Vermont or any Vermonter can invest by using that regulation, that exemption. I believe that's the first time I've heard about it. So you guys are saying that you can do anybody. Exactly. Yeah, but to, to, to sell a stake in your company, a uh, share or partnership. So in the case of, I'll get to both of you in just a moment, in Kate's case, wanting to raise equity, or in her case, convertible debt, from individuals who were not accredited investors, <coughs> the VSBOE made that possible, and so did Milk Month. That yep, for people in Vermont. Exactly, for people in Vermont. Jim was next. Um, is the, and, and, and maybe it's our Milk Money person that can answer this, are those laws, to, I mean, I've heard sort of out in the world about the JOBS Act and how that's changing that. Where do we stand sort of as a, are those rules changing so it's just not Vermonter to Vermonter because we're a pretty small market? 
So in May of last of 2016, actually, there was the national crowdfunding. So companies can do regulation CF crowdfunding, and they basically, you know, you could then go after any American who's not accredited. But you have to be, you can either, you have to use. Um, a platform that is basically registered with the SEC. So those guys have to be broker dealers. It's still being registered. So you have still all those high, much higher costs than coming to Milk Money, where you're just keeping it local. And the benefit of Milk Money is that she's got her local community. And basically, we help her market to her community um, to keep the money local, to keep the money in Vermont. When you say a much higher cost, do you mean a much higher dollar amount to get in? Yes. Or the well, cost of the intermediary to raise? Well, her cost of capital would have been higher because she'd have to pay the crowdfunding portal. Um, they charge much more than we do because they're allowed to charge much more than we do. Plus, she has the cost of capital to the investors. So what do they charge? Do you know? some, well, they're allowed to charge success fees. So, I mean, some of them, like NextSeed, charges 10%. You know, so, so you're going to have a higher cost to basically to the portal, plus the money that you're having to pay to your investors. And so we try to keep the cost down yeah. so that you're giving more back to right. the investors. such a small market. Though. And keeping yeah. local money is local is great, but yeah. I, I'm patriotic too, and I, I felt like I really have to pull some money in. <laughs> yes. I'm curious, we've heard how the four businesses have, where their money is coming from. I'm curious where the four lenders get their money from. Oh, oh nice. Uh, I'll start, in, as I mentioned, uh, we raise money from individuals like all of you who essentially lend us money, uh, and we turn around and re-lend it. Uh, we have somewhere around 300 individual investors. Uh, it's closer to 400 now. 400, now. 500 investments, 500. And then we also uh, borrow money or raise investments from institutions, including um, uh, religious orders uh, who use some of their retirement money to invest in us, uh, various government agencies, uh, corporations. Ironically, some of the biggest investors in uh, community development loan funds are banks. Go figure. Um, yeah, so that's where we get our money. Uh, but uh, Maggie, why don't you go next? Uh, we get our money very similarly to, to where Raymond's organization does. I would say, looking at my cheat sheet here, um, slightly over half of our money comes from individuals, either directly or through trusts. We get 12% of our funds last year came from faith based community nuns who give us their retirement money and we don't lose it. Um, we, we also get money from banks. They get CRA, Community Reinvestment Act, credits for putting money into CDFIs because we invest money in communities and then they don't have to do that directly. Not that I'm feeling snarky. Um, we do get some money from the government. We, get, we now are an intermediary lender to small businesses with SBA money, and we get money from the Treasury's Community Development Finance Institution Fund. Um, a little bit from nonprofits, a little bit from foundations, and a small percentage from cooperatives who have become successful enough that they will reinvest extra money that they have. Well, not really extra, but you know, some of their profits will sit with us for a while, and then we lend it back out to other co-ops. Lisa. So we're different than the others because actually it's Vermont guys who are actually supplying money to be investing direct. So you're making a direct investment into companies like Case. We have, we've had nine campaigns. We've raised over, uh, over $350,000 from 100 plus uh, So you're so you only direct intermediary? So we basically learn over the platform. We facilitate. So we facilitate. So we basically help pay, navigate, fund financial regulation rules, help her basically submit the offering, talk about the different types of offerings. So we can do different ones. It doesn't have to be able to do that. Um, I basically put it online, um, and the rule is, is basically anybody can actually see her offering documents, but only the monitors can invest. And so basically making sure that, you know, they have a, they have a, you know, the driver's license, we do the notes, we keep track of the, you know, cap table, and basically help where we can in terms of facilitation of the investors. But so it's for monitors that are investing directly. Janice, flexible capital fund. Yeah, I'll stand up so you can hear. Um, we have two primary sources of capital. We initially raised uh, equity investment from accredited investors because at the time the, the federal bill and the VISVA wasn't really um, going to work for us. So we have 38 investors, half of which are from Vermont, half of which are from outside the uh, state of Vermont, actually around the country, which is 
fascinating for us because we are Vermont focused. Um, so we raised equity and then um, about three years after we did that initial raise, we became certified as a CDFI, a, a Community Development Financial Institution. So we also get U.S. Treasury funds in the form of grants, which is nice because it doesn't dilute the ownership of our investors. And we have funds for lost reserves, um, technical assistance, and capital. And both those sources of capital um, are, make it such that we can be very flexible in how we structure our investments. No one investment is, um, every investment is different based on the company's needs, um, and we're not constrained necessarily by um, having debt that we have to service because it's equity and grant funds. So there's opportunities as individuals, uh, both for accredited investors and non-accredited investors, to invest in Vermont through these various platforms. And elsewhere in New England, if it's the cooperative under New England, I apologize. Other questions? Yes? Hi, I was wondering, do any of you guys have uh, boards of advisors or boards of directors? I know it's not as applicable for, maybe for advisors, but just to your organizations, has that been a, a source of help over the years? Uh, well, why don't we start here and go down the line? I'd love to hear the answer from each of you. So we do have a board of advisors, um, and that's entirely people from outside of our operation. Our board of directors is all worker owners. Um, but we have uh, 10, no, 11 advisors um, who are people we have relationships with, um, some longer term, some not, um, who have, and this is, we did a phone, we came a co-op, so there was you know, sort of informal advi advice that happened. Um, in the years up to that, um, and then we formalized it, and it's a lot of work um, to sort of prepare a meeting, um, and it's hard to like really dedicate the time to prepare everybody, and then we're always like amazed at really like how 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 solid the advice is and how worthwhile it is to put the time into so, like just thinking very big picture, stepping back from our day to day operations and um, getting it outside. But, uh, it's actually part of my strategic plan for this year to put together a board of advisors. I have a collection of people in different places that I go to um, so that I'm not talking, arguing with myself all the time. <laughs> um, but I think it's time to formalize it so that everybody is in the same place at the same time or at least on, on the phone at the same time and so that it um, injects some structure into my big picture. There's a real natural time of the year for stepping back and doing big picture thinking for me, and that's great, but um, it needs to be followed through. Here. That structure will help me follow through. Um, it is on my strategic plan. I've identified about six people who have agreed to be on. Board of Advisors haven't convened yet, and Janice keeps letting me know that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we just uh, instituted a formal board of directors prior to, uh, we did not have an outside board member beyond Tom, the owner, and me. Um, we just added one um, as an independent board member, but with the uh, Series A preferred round that we completed. So one of those Series A has joined the board. Series A investors has joined the board. One of the great things about community development Lending institutions like Cooperative Fund, Flexible Capital Fund, and BCLF is we're, unlike a bank, we want to have an ongoing relationship with our borrowers, and, and that can increase accountability uh, for some of the kinds of things that you've heard discussed here, especially if your lender is Janice, apparently. <laughs> yes. Uh, I just want to hear a little bit more on that in terms of the, the relationship with the advisors for other institutions. Uh, how much do you lean on them? How much were they? Uh, and how broad is advice? Why don't we start with Tom and work our way back? How do your lenders help you as advisors? Um. They, uh, I'm sorry. They drew, no, 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 no. It's great. It's great. I'm thinking, well, which one? And how do I? Um, first and foremost, they um, they push rigor and they'll throw a bucket of cold water on you, um, which is really important, especially if you're you're working with a founder and a mission based. 
um, you can get really excited about all these things that you're going to do. But um, no, no money, no mission. Um, and uh, and that's, that's really kind of an important thing. And if you're alone saying that to a founder owner, it can get a little... Uh, little old. Um, so having a, a lender that helps you with that is great. Um, and then uh, looking for uh, board members that add skill sets that you don't have, but also have experiences. So the board member we added was um, his grandparents owned a dairy farm up in uh, uh, Greensboro. He spent all his summers up there. He ended up going, uh, after he got out of business school, he ended up going to Goldman Sachs. He was a general partner, um, left Goldman Sachs when they went public because he didn't like what it was changed, how it changed the, um, the method of investing and the thoughtfulness of the investing. And he's with a, a boutique uh, investment bank in Baltimore, and he cares very much. He owns three farms. He know, is very knowledgeable about seed growing, and he's very sharp financially. He's been on, he's, uh, on the board of trustees of uh, Vanderbilt, I think. Um, and so he's seen a lot, and um, he helps uh, buttress uh, the the balance between the, the vision and the, um, the practicalities. And since uh, talking with him as a potential investor, I've leveraged him in multiple conversations, probably once every four to six weeks. Um, and, uh, and I'll use, uh, we're, right now we're doing a, an asset transfer where I've leveraged communication with Raymond communication with People's Bank and communication with our accountant and with our board member in order to facilitate the uh, proper, in my view, proper move with that asset. So that's the best I can answer. <laughs> Craig? Yeah, well, you, you got to witness a little bit of it, but I mean, in all honesty, um, as an entrepreneur, you tend to be putting out the fires that are right in front of you and kind of dealing with day-to-day -day stuff that you think is important. And it's great every once in a while to get a call from Janice or, you know, one of the lenders to say, hey, what about that information that you said you would promise, you promised a little while ago? Um, he says, because, you know, you really need to keep people informed. And so Janice is prodding me to do that and to stay on top of those things, um, even though other priorities are you know, fighting for attention all the time. And it's important, and once I do it, I realize, right, that's really important to keep everybody in the loop. And it's that type of advice for me that's most valuable, but also their knowledge and connection in the greater investing community and in the finance end of things um, is always a great perspective. Um, I lean on my lender or have uh, lent on my, my loan fund lenders in really concrete ways, like there's a free QuickBooks training um, or somebody offers to sit down with me and look at the actual numbers and help me um, figure out what they actually mean. Um, at this stage, I feel like the person on the other side of the table has a lot more time than I do, <laughs> so I don't take advantage of that as much as I could. Um, but I have to give a shout out to um, Community National Bank, who's my bank. Uh, the, the folks there are as involved in cheerleading, I'm not at the, I'm not at the bucket of cold water stage yet, <laughs> cheerleading sort of and giving me more of a big picture, big picture feedback about how things are going. So um, we're looking for a great bank. They're really wonderful. Um, so, directly, CFE um, has offered two trainings to our whole board over the past two years, which has been really great. Um, we just did one this spring, um, just talking about strategic planning and ways to think about that. Um, and then, because um, you know, there's sort of myself and the general manager of the business who handle the finances. Um, and as a board, we have to make financial decisions. So there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of different levels of education about finance um, within our group of people. Um, and they just did a basic financial education training, you know. And we do that for our board as well. But 
um, it's really great to have an outside person who with a lot more experience than we do um, just to go over the nuts and bolts and like uh, explain to people you know how to read a balance sheet and ratios to pay attention to and um, and it's been great and then our um, our local bank um, you know we, we send quarterly updates and you know it's great to get questions back and feedback and if we have concerns and we say oh we're a little concerned about this or that and they can allay the concerns or say oh why don't you keep thinking about it and offer some ideas um, yeah so they're definitely very available for help you know their money's at stake and they want it to succeed and they know that that takes education and um, advice I want to give a shout out to two organizations. Kate mentioned that uh, they borrowed, I think it's Kate said, they borrowed initially from Community Capital of Vermont. And that's also a CDFI, um, very similar, they do work very similar to what VCLF does. And they have a very robust business advisory service that includes, for example, the free QuickBooks classes that Kate mentioned. Um, uh, their executive director, Rich Grogan, will be at the summit tomorrow. I don't think he's speaking, but if you're interested. Um, and then Cooperative Fund in New England. You know, there's hundreds of, the, of uh, community development loan funds across the country. CFNE is one of the only ones, one of, uh, that focuses on co-ops, co-ops and other democratically controlled organizations. And a big part of what is different about CFNE from other loan funds is their, their ability and their willingness to coach cooperative uh, businesses in how to um, how to be cooperatives uh, and how to grow. It's a very unique thing that I think most of us aren't that familiar with. Um, and so that's a great service to see if any Other questions, comments, cow jokes? Can I add one thing about, Please. there was a little equity conversation. Um, and there are, so when we, um, Purchased like when the cooperative purchased the business from the founders, um, we raised preferred share equity, equity, and we did use um, there are exemptions that all the draconian SEC laws from the 30s, um, and they were you know and then you know when once you're exempted from that you do have to navigate your state securities law, um, but that's generally a lot easier. Um, and we were able to raise money both in Massachusetts and Vermont. We made two separate offerings that were identical, and all the work was identical. Um, and you know, every state's laws are different, so it's not always the, it won't always be identical. But um, there are ways. And if you're interested in learning more about um, that, I would recommend uh, Jenny Kasson's book, the name of which I forget. I don't know if anybody else has it on the top of her head. It just came out last year um, and she, you know and she's she's a lawyer from California and we worked with her on our direct public offering um, and it was uh, very successful um, and I would highly recommend if you're interested going down that road Janice is looking that up yeah raise capital on your own terms there it is $9.99 other questions yes uh, question to lenders. I was wondering, does any of the there's been some discussion about CRA, and I'm not sure where that stands as far as the current administration thinking about it. Is that a ongoing concern? And just a second, unrelated uh, question or related just back to this discussion. How important is it to you guys to see the entrepreneurs put together towards advisors opposite or to Genesis? <laughs> Right. So, so I'll start with the CRA question. CRA, the Community Reinvestment Act, is a, um, is a law with very few teeth. Now, that is supposed to induce banks to make investments in their communities, uh, in particular in low-income communities. The main place where CRA has had teeth over the years is when uh, banks want to acquire other banks or acquire branches of other banks. And if they haven't passed their CRA test acceptably, they might be limited in what they can do. But it's a rarity that the CRA's teeth come in play. Nonetheless, it has helped motivate banks to invest in CDFIs and in other organizations that, um, uh, that help communities. When you see banks making grants in local communities, they're motivated by CRA. 
With that said, I don't know what the current status is uh, in the current administration. I, I, I don't know that CRA can get much worse other than going away. Um, and it could be a lot better. I don't think that's going to happen. But it, does, it does also apply to insurance companies. Ah. Mm -hmm. that, that's something that was enacted, I don't know, over the last 10 years. I think CRA was extended to cover insurance companies. But again, I, I don't know how much compliance there is, what the consequences are of not complying, other than if you want to acquire another company. I, I don't know. Yeah, it's interesting. We, it has very little in the way of teeth. And yet banks, the banks I've worked for, paid attention to it. It's not like bank, banks generally aren't mission-driven organizations, so it's never been top of their agenda. I think when you look at credit unions, and in particular community development credit unions, you see a lot more attention to that kind of community reinvestment without having CRA as an umbrella over those organizations. So, um, you know, there's motivation. I, I, I would add that, that it's actually the CDFI fund of the Treasury is is uh, absolutely at risk under this administration. Yes, yes. which has nothing to do with CRA, but an excellent uh, just point. Just speaking of money that feeds these industries, these, these uh, entities, that uh, is, is really helpful to us. I mean, it, it funds a lot of our loan loss reserve, which is what often helps us not lose our investors' money. Um, and and there has been talk in the administration of just eliminating the CDFI. Yeah. The CDFI fund is, as Maggie said, a part of the U.S. Treasury. It was, uh, it was initiated during the, the Clinton, Clinton era, uh, but it's always had bipartisan support. And uh, every administration has looked at cutting it back or getting rid of it. I think even some of uh, the Obama administration's budgets looked at cutting it back. And Congress <coughs> always fully funded it or increased it because it is one of the most uh, effective tools that Congress has used uh, to invest in low-income communities through these intermediaries, CDFIs, like our organizations. So if you ever uh, have a chance to talk with your representative, your elected, rep elected representative, tell them that CDFI fund matters. Because that turns out the government is the biggest investor in CDFIs. And they're not just investors, they're, as Maggie said earlier, they give money to our organizations so we can do the work that we do that banks aren't able to do. So they, they, make, they make grants and they make low interest loans. Exactly. It, it's usually a matter, but it, it's hugely valuable, that money. So yeah, I would say advocate on Good point. The other question was about boards of advisors. You asked what uh, our view on boards of advisors, and I'll let Jana start since she has a view. <laughs> I, I, I do. I mean, I, I'm joking, hopefully Greg's joking as well, but I've been a proponent of getting an advisory board for any entrepreneur who doesn't have a board or doesn't have a formal advisory capacity for the purpose of you don't want to be arguing in your own head. And because getting some, if you can identify where your strengths are and then where you need to fill in those gaps and bring them to the table together, there's power in that room to help you work on your business, not in your business. And for, you know, if you do have an advisory board that's quarterly, that's, you know, and if that's the only time you work on your business, it's better than nothing. And it's an opportunity to not only have instant access to those advisory board members' networks, but to their, to their uh, expertise and to, to help you get up and out to really think long term about how you want to your business. So I'm a big um, proponent of it. So I echo, we echo Janice, what she said, but you know, with no money, we're also looking at the team itself. So we do say, yes, you should really get an advisory board for all the reasons that Janice said. Um, if you're just one single entrepreneur, you just can't do it all. So we always say you need to have a team. If you're even going to consider doing something on milk, uh, doing a milk money raise, because me, myself, and I is just not going to be able to run the business and do marketing and all the things that are needed to basically to raise money. So we really are like team, you know, and team, because people are really investing in Kate and her husband as a team who are going to make that happen in the business growth. Um, so we're both advisory, but also really Yeah, um, cooperatives kind of have to have a board of directors. So, which in a very small worker co-op can be everybody. Um, as the workforce grows, it should be a smaller a percentage of everybody and mutually elected, some co-ops will set up a sort of a revolving mandatory participation in the board so everybody gets a chance to be in the position of having to make 
sort of the bigger decisions. I mean, they're like structured decisions, right? There'll be a manager often who makes day-to-day -day decisions. There'll be the board that makes sort of the overall operating decisions. And then really big decisions generally get made by everybody because it's a democratically controlled organization. Um, yeah, this is going to make me go back and think more about advisory boards, I think. We, we will recommend or require an advisory board for a business that seems to be a little shaky. And often we um, have lenders as part of that advisory board to sort of help stabilize. So I would say not every co-op with whom we work or to whom we lend has an advisory board. But I think I would think about that more at this point because I think the point of not just talking to yourself um, or your co-workers because you are often all in the weeds and it's easy for everybody to procrastinate or to set something aside because there's more pressing immediate stuff. I think that's that's not unique to, to non-cause, right? So I think maybe having some outside people who come in, whether it's a separate board or whether you include outside experts on your board of directors, I think can be really helpful. Can I chime in on that? Uh, yes. Real quick. Please do. Fresh Tracks Capital has made 45 investments, 45 investments over 18 years. I can unequivocally say the best performing companies have the best boards and they run a really good process. And I can unequivocally say that our worst performing companies were the opposite of that. They had. They did not pay attention to their boards. They did not even pay attention to the formation of the boards. They didn't run a good process. And de facto, they don't, they don't perform. So I can unequivocally say that. Wait, I got a question for you. How many outside board members uh, when you say they have great outside board? Well, my, my, my um, belief, individual belief, is that you should have a five person board. Two of them should be founder related stockholders. Two of them should be. Uh, this isn't an investor in, in investing. Two of them should be investors and one should be independent. You, you could also, in a smaller company without investors, say two founders and one independent, the way I hear um, High Mowing talk about, although that actually is an investor. So, so if, uh, five. yeah, so you got five, so then you've got two independents. We've got three right now, and we're planning on expanding the five very, yeah. very good. That, over the next yeah, that, 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 that's what I do. Yeah. Thanks. Well, we're almost at time, so shield your eyes, everybody. And you the side of that Sorry. So we've talked about a little piece, okay, a big piece of the continuum, which Janice has here in paper. If you want to take paper home with you, uh, we talked a little bit about banks and senior debt, but really the other thing is subordinated debt, royalty financing, and convertible debt, and how all of that in some cases relates to equity. You know, shut it down now so I don't buy these size people. Um, uh, what, what I was hoping we would get out of this session is uh, to understand what type of debt is most appropriate for your business, and I think the answer is always it depends. But hopefully these stories helped illustrate that depending on the stage of your business, depending on the availability of collateral, depending on how much you want to engage with friends and family and other types of investors, and, and depending on your cash flow, there are different types of debt out there that might be appropriate for you at any given time. And perhaps the biggest takeaway for me is that virtually all of these businesses have used all of those kinds of debt at various times uh, in their life cycles and probably will continue to do so. Um, we're just about done. Please come down to the front and take the paper, the pieces of paper that these entrepreneurs brought with them and that Janice brought as well. If you have questions after this, uh, you are certainly welcome to email any of us. If you have a question, I can just a quick one. I yeah. say thank you so much for, for sharing all that you do. I love those tech rules. They're all so yeah. much. Awesome. Yeah. What you guys are doing, it's just incredible. Thanks for sharing. We love hearing this stuff. Yeah. Well, thanks for coming. And two last things. Uh, take a bottle of water if you like, because they're left and they should be drunk. And uh, John, the executive director of the Latchets uh, Theater, uh, is uh, happy to show you the main theater downstairs, the Art Deco facility that is just awesome. So if you haven't seen it and you're not up here talking with all of us, take advantage of John's offer to see the theater downstairs. Thank you to, to the Latchets for hosting us. Thanks for all of you.